Well, as the very name Combined Arms implies, we're talking about the fact that no one soldier or one weapon system wins a war. Every weapon, every branch has its own strengths and vulnerabilities, which means that overcoming your opponent requires integrating the different arms and weapons so that they make up for each other's shortcomings and exploit the limitations of the enemy. The winner on the battlefield is the side that is better at combining and maneuvering all those different capabilities together. Combined arms warfare has existed for centuries. During the Napoleonic era, it took the form of an infantry, artillery, cavalry triad, with each arm entering into combat at the most opportune moments. Typically, linear formations of artillery and infantry created the conditions favorable for columns of cavalry to charge the enemy. This charge was expected to produce the shock effect necessary to break the enemy line, resulting in victory. Control of this triad was normally retained at a high command level. Napoleon has, for example, uh, centralization of planning, and he is the one who, in fact, has to decide rock, paper, scissors, so to speak, that while the individual regimental commander typically has to use different formations, he does it all at the behest of the general, and it's the general who is actually integrating the different main arms and deciding when the, uh, the uh, artillery will blow holes in the enemy, when the cavalry will charge, and so on and so forth. The loss of maneuver. By the end of the 19th century, the previous concept of combined arms changed. Several technological innovations made the battlefield far more deadly. Repeating rifles, recoiling quick-firing artillery, machine guns. With these innovations present on the open battlefield, the linear formations of Western armies could no longer survive. As Europe plunged into a world war in 1914, it encountered a new type of warfare. When the armies of Germany attempted to maneuver around the Allied forces of France and the United Kingdom on the Western Front, the engagements became so deadly that both sides rapidly identified the need to entrench their forces in order to survive. Maneuver warfare quickly transformed into static trench warfare. The lines of advancing arrows disappeared and became two parallel front lines that stretched from the Swiss border to the English Channel. These lines became complex trench systems that the major powers attempted to break. Both sides initially deployed the majority of their forces along the front trenches, attempting to hold every inch of hard-won ground. Because of their manpower and material advantages, the Allies were usually the attacker between 1915 and 1917. In these first years of the war, the most common plan of attack was sequential. Artillery was to destroy a portion of the enemy line. Infantry would then occupy that area. Mounted cavalry would exploit the breach. This seemed like an easy solution, but there were complications. Once you get to World War I, where everybody has to disperse to take cover, now command and control is no longer possible in a centralized way. You have to have the communications and the subordinate initiative to operate at the very lowest level. Both sides slowly created elaborate bands of trench lines, thousands of meters in depth. By 1917, the Germans had designated multiple areas. The outpost zone, the battle zone, the rearward zone. Known as the elastic defense, the Germans moved the majority of their troops off the front line and repositioned them throughout these zones. This defense in depth presented the Allies with multiple problems as they attempted to penetrate it. A major complication was the ineffectiveness of their artillery preparation. The Allies often fired barrages of hundreds of thousands of rounds, lasting days, even weeks. This helped the infantry to cross no man's land but did not destroy the enemy line. During the Allied preparatory fires, the soldiers in the outpost zone moved to nearby craters, while the battle zone soldiers were protected in deep bunkers. Once the Allied barrage ceased, 
The surviving German infantry were able to reoccupy damaged, but still usable, defensive positions in the outpost zone. Unfortunately for the Allies, the ultimate result of a week of bombardment was the creation of rugged terrain that was difficult to negotiate for follow-on forces, artillery, and supply trains. After attacking through a depleted outpost zone, the Allies now faced the battle zone, where the Germans had positioned the majority of their forces. The German defenders were well protected and organized, while the advancing Allied formations were beginning to break up and difficult to control. Since portable wireless communication was not yet developed, artillery fire could only support the infantry by blindly shifting fires forward, passing over the Germans protected in deep bunkers, and using a timeline that the infantry was expected to follow. The Allied infantry had difficulty keeping up with this rolling barrage. German outpost resistance and a rigid Allied decision-making process slowed the infantry advance. This inability to keep up with the artillery meant that the Germans had more time to emerge from their bunkers and prepare to defend. The farther forward the Allied infantry moved, the less likely they would have artillery support due to limited range, and the fact that the batteries could not easily displace across the damaged ground they had created. On the other side of this Allied dilemma was a defending German force that had telephone communication and control over their artillery support. More importantly, lower-level commanders had the authority to make decisions. They could order a counterattack at the right time and place, not waiting for approval from a higher authority. Local commanders controlled any additional troops brought in as reinforcements. At critical moments, when the Allied attacks faltered, the Germans were able to conduct an active defense against a vulnerable foe and quickly retake any lost ground. The Search for a Solution Once the stalemate sets in, in late 1914, early 1915. The problem from the point of view of all commanders is how do I restore mobility to the battlefield? How do I penetrate and exploit the trench system so that we don't have to fight it anymore? And the solutions attempted by the Western Allies, because the Germans are primarily on the defensive at that point, is different technologies. And they try each of these technologies almost piecemeal. One of those attempted solutions was gas. Artillery alone could not destroy a defensive position, so it was believed poisonous gas could create a gap. While initially effective, it was largely countered by simply wearing protective masks. The end result was a more terrifying and confusing battlefield. Another attempted solution was the use of aircraft. New to warfare, this asset was used to conduct reconnaissance, strafe, and even bomb the enemy. But the aircraft of World War I never fully developed the ability to use wireless radios for immediate reporting or carry a sufficient bomb payload to significantly affect an enemy defensive line. Finally, and most promising, was the development of the tank. The British and French independently developed tanks, not a tank as a high-speed turreted weapon designed to ex exploit and fight other armored vehicles, but rather as a means of taking firepower and protection across the enemy trenches in an all-terrain vehicle. But these tanks were vulnerable. The Germans were able to counter them by developing anti-tank weapons and using some of their light artillery in direct fire mode. Tank survival required the close cooperation of the infantry, which did not occur on a large scale until the last part of the war. So you have all these different technological solutions, piles of artillery, piles of gas, uh, tanks, close air support, all kinds of things, but they tended to be applied separately. And while each of them had an advocate who thought this was the solution, everyone else was so skeptical that if they did succeed in breaking through, no one was prepared to exploit it. Eventually, both sides attempted to end the stalemate by integrating these new innovations. It was the Germans who would first employ combined arms warfare on a large scale. The 
the answer is found. The Germans do not have the kind of production capability that the Allies did. They're hard pressed to simply equip, particularly because of the blockade, and, and maintain their society. So the Germans tend to look for non-technological solutions to their problem. Faced with the United States entering the war in 1917, the German High Command realized they had one last opportunity to defeat the Allies before they were overwhelmed by enemy troops and resources. They therefore turned to tactics and techniques learned in their elastic defense and applied them to their offense. Known as the Spring Offensive, the Germans attacked on 21 March 1918 with positive results. While this offensive ultimately failed for strategic and operational reasons, the Germans utilized combined arms tactics to create these massive penetrations. Unlike previous attempts, where singular arms were asked to create the breakthrough, the German arms were looked upon to cooperate, complementing each other's strength and compensating for any weaknesses. With the exception of any use of the tank, all the German arms combined and worked together. German use of artillery became a cornerstone of its combined arms strategy. Aircraft reconnaissance identified specific targets, such as enemy strong points, command posts, and artillery batteries. The Germans then conducted not week-long, but hour-long intense barrages, concentrating primarily on these critical areas. We decided only to break the morale of the enemy, pin him to his position, and then overcome him with an overwhelming assault. This not only helped the infantry attain surprise, but it also did not tear up the ground that they would eventually have to traverse. Finally, it put the enemy into great confusion. I was impressed by the way it came down, with one big crash. I had always thought that the bombardment would develop gradually, but the full force was almost instantaneous. We all ran like mad for cover. As the German infantry advanced, they did not do so in large waves, but in small groups. The first groups were specially trained soldiers called storm troops that infiltrated past the Allied strong points and into the rear areas. They also attacked command posts, intending to create more confusion. Follow-on units with heavy equipment, including light artillery, destroyed the bypass strong points. Similar to the elastic defense, lower-level commanders were authorized to make timely decisions to maintain the attack's momentum and allow for the rapid reinforcement of success. Unlike the Allies, the German artillery's rolling barrage moved at the infantry's pace. Their artillery did not shift forward until the infantry, who controlled it with pyrotechnics, was ready to move forward. The Allied infantry had little time to react to the advancing Germans. To round out this combined arms team, pioneer units assisted in mobility by reducing obstacles for the infantry and creating lanes for the artillery to move forward. The formula that finally broke the stalemate on the Western Front was the combined arms approach. Different arms complementing each other, employed by lower level commanders that could make timely decisions. While the Germans were unable to exploit their tactical success due to strategic limitations, the Allies implemented this formula to good use in the summer and fall of 1918. Tanks, infantry, and artillery were integrated into combined arms formations, improving the effectiveness of all. The Western Front finally witnessed a return to mobility on the battlefield as World War I came to an end. The Interwar Period, France and Germany. The horror of World War I meant that people were not willing to even prepare for another war. That means they won't invest, they won't train, they won't get ready for a war because they don't want to fight it. Against this mindset of nations hoping another war would never come, military leaders still struggled to prepare their country's defenses. In the years that followed World War I, all of the major belligerents evaluated their experiences and implemented changes to their doctrine and materiel attempting to avoid repeating the horrors of trench warfare. Social, economic, and political factors all influenced the evolving thought on warfare, as did new equipment innovations. There were improvements in firepower, more capable transportation for both personnel and logistics, 
mobile radio communications, tactical vehicles to assist infantry on the battlefield, and vast improvements in aircraft and their ability to deliver effective payloads. At the forefront of this military technological evolution was the tank. During the interwar period, tanks greatly improved in their mobility, protection, and firepower. Most countries saw them as isolated weapon systems that could either support infantry with slow-moving, heavy tanks, or be grouped together as cavalry, using light, mobile tanks to pursue, harass, and exploit enemy forces. France was one of those countries. The French are facing a number of problems. First of all, they know how they won in 1918, but it required an enormously tight integration and coordination, combined arms, of all the different elements. And so they have a communication structure and a staff planning structure that is designed to replicate that very tight control and coordination. The problem is they don't necessarily have the troops that they had had in 1918 in large measure because the French public is understandably not willing to ever contemplate a war of that kind again. So the French army goes from drafting people for three years of service to down to nine months of service. So that means now you, if you are a French commander or staff officer, you're trying to get this very high level of sophistication out of troops that in your mind at least are incapable of doing that. And that means you want to be very rigid, very oriented, keep everybody a lockstep so that the infantry can somehow achieve the breakthrough you did in World War I. At the center of their doctrine during the interwar years was the infantry. The infantry is charged with the principal mission in combat, preceded, protected, and accompanied by artillery fire. Aided where possible by tanks and aviation, it conquers, occupies, organizes, and holds the terrain. The French believed in methodical preparations prior to the battle and then carefully controlling it once it began. The battle would occur at the speed of the infantry. All other arms would support the infantry as their legs carried them forward. French tanks many of which were superior to any tank in the world due to their heavy armor and firepower, were tied to the movement of the infantry. The tanks were thought of as a sort of armored infantry and interspersed throughout the French army. To complicate matters for the French, their communications remained slow, methodical, and designed to operate with the same degree of centralized control as in World War I. Field telephones, not field radios, were the norm in 1940. Finally, French armored divisions were organized with a large number of tanks and very little support from the other arms. The intent of this design was to exploit the breach the French expected their infantry to create. In contrast, after the Germans analyzed their World War I experience, they created an armored division that was a combined arms organization. While the French armored division contained two brigades of tanks, supported by only one battalion of infantry, the German Panzer Division was more balanced. It consisted of one Panzer Brigade and one motorized infantry brigade, supported by an artillery regiment and additional battalions of reconnaissance, engineers, anti-tank, and anti-aircraft. Much like the storm battalions of World War I, German units could task organize into battle groups, or Kampfgruppe. Based on the mission, these groups could concentrate all of their arms at the decisive point to create and exploit a breach. But unlike the storm battalions, everything in the Panzer Division was expected to move at the speed of the tank, not the speed of the infantry. The Germans thus attempted to motorize as much of their armored division as they could. Additionally, every vehicle had a mount for a wireless radio to allow for decentralized control and to facilitate rapid and flexible movement. Lower level commanders had the authority to make decisions based on the situation and could order their units to make changes at a pace not previously possible. You have to remember that the Prussian army and then the German army had a long heritage of subordinate initiative. 
whether it was the initiative of general staff officers or the initiative of cavalry commanders seeing something on the battlefield and exploiting it without orders. They had always had this sort of freedom of movement to accomplish a common intent. You come forward into the post-World War I era. Dozens of committees of veterans of World War I sat down and analyzed that experience of decentralized, flexible command and control, both offensive and defensive, and applied that into their doctrine. But now comes, in the early 1930s, mechanization. And that's the frosting on the cake, because when you have all these motor, motorized vehicles, mechanized vehicles, all of which have radio mounts, uh, all of them have this way of communicating that allows them to now move and react to situations the same way they've been trying to do historically, but at a much quicker pace than they ever have before. And that is the kind of advantage that the Germans have that's not really necessarily visible to somebody, uh, but in comparison to, for example, the, very, the fairly rigid French and British staff system, this allows them to move much more quickly uh, and react to opportunities in 1940. Combined Arms in Action, the Battle of France, 1940. On 10 May, 1940, the Germans attacked the French army and the British Expeditionary Force. To counter this, the French deployed 36 tank battalions along its border to support their infantry divisions. Additionally, the French leadership was confident in the anti-tank weapons that were assigned to their infantry divisions and estimated that they could repulse up to 50 enemy tanks per kilometer. Unfortunately for the French, the Germans were able to mass twice that number of panzers against selected divisions. The German army concentrated seven of its 10 panzer divisions in the Ardennes forest. But panzers were only part of the story. Even though a vast majority of the German army was comprised of regular infantry divisions and corps, they concentrated their combined arms units to break through the thin French line. German panzers rapidly penetrated the unbalanced French infantry. German infantry and artillery were able to counter French anti-tank guns. German anti-aircraft guns were utilized as direct fire weapons to defeat French heavy tanks. Engineers improved the poor roads of the Ardennes. They also assisted in river crossings while covered by artillery and armor. If the artillery could not keep pace with the rapid armor thrusts, German aircraft, particularly the Stuka dive bomber, were available for air interdiction. All of these assets were controlled and coordinated by a command structure that was organized and equipped to make rapid decisions and communicate them to subordinates quickly. Within two weeks of the start of the campaign, the Germans had reached the English Channel. They had encircled and then captured or destroyed the best trained and equipped units of the French army. Unfortunately for the French, they were not prepared to counter this attack. Their centralized and slow command system placed them continuously behind the German decision cycle. Their emphasis on battles of position at the speed of the infantry was not conducive to counterattacking the main German drive. The one element of their army that stood a chance of having an effect, their armor divisions, were unwieldy to control and vulnerable to German anti-tank weapons. While the German victory was due to multiple factors, their well-synchronized combined arms teams gave the German military a significant advantage at the tactical level. The world would describe this new combined arms approach as Blitzkrieg. The United States searches to counter Blitzkrieg in Europe. The interwar U.S. Army has a number of restrictions on it, some of which are in common with those of Europe, some of which are unique. Uh, in common with that of Europe, uh, the American people, the American politicians, are reluctant to even contemplate the thought of another major war, and therefore they tend to cut down the size of the Army to the lowest possible uh, level they can imagine. While the Battle of France raged in Europe, 3,000 miles and one ocean away, the United States Army was stunned by the rapid defeat of the French military. 
A decade of economic shortages and anti-war sentiment had left this army in a weakened condition. The army starts out with a plan in 1920 for an army that should be about 280,000 minimum. And in fact, it ends up with somewhere about a half of that amount or less by 1940. And Along with the fact that it now has restricted manpower, the Army also has restricted materiel. The attitude of politicians in America, as in France for that matter, was, well, you have a tank that we built in 1918. As long as it runs, don't ask us to build you another one. The near total destruction of the French Army, considered the most powerful army in Europe at the time, shocked the U.S. Army out of its complacency. American military leaders, who assumed the U.S. would soon be joining this war, needed to rapidly find solutions to counter the Blitzkrieg. Germany's use of panzers forced an American reassessment, as U.S. infantry divisions appeared extremely vulnerable. Furthermore, U.S. armored divisions did not yet exist. The U.S. Army would have to build an organization and doctrine from scratch. And the Americans say, hey, we're not ready for this. The problem is that the Americans are not necessarily correctly viewing the conflict that is going on in Europe. They're getting everything second and third hand, and they don't necessarily draw the correct lessons. What everybody talks about is tanks, 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 everywhere tanks, not necessarily the combined arms flexible nature of the German mechanization. Instead of mirroring German combined arms, the U.S. War Department looked to streamline its force and create specific solutions to specific problems. They formed an army that employed two unique elements, the tank destroyer and the concept of pooling specialized equipment. Both were designed to defeat a German army that appeared to be able to penetrate an enemy line at will. The birth of the U.S. tank destroyer. The U.S. raced to reconstitute its army. In the two years prior to their entry into the war, the army relied heavily on one critical doctrinal concept. The tank's primary task was to attack and exploit enemy weakness. The infantry and artillery were expected to breach the enemy line. The tank would then pass through to disrupt the enemy's vulnerable rear area. To accomplish this mission, the first armored divisions were tank heavy, much like the British and French divisions of the early 1940s. With their structure containing a large number of light tanks that favored mobility for exploitation operations on their own, it appeared that the U.S. was not focused on combined arms warfare. Additionally, American war planners did not envision tanks engaging other tanks. General Leslie McNair, commander of U.S. Army ground forces, responsible for building and training the American force, stated, The tank's natural and proper victim is unprotected personnel and materiel. He went on to say, Certainly, it is poor economy to use a $35,000 medium tank to destroy another tank when the job can be done by a gun costing a fraction as much. Thus, the friendly armored force is freed to attack a more proper target, the opposing force as a whole. From this then, the United States comes up with a completely new organizational solution to deal with what it regards as a completely new operational problem. How do we deal with armor? And the answer is the tank destroyer. Known officially as a gun motor carriage, the tank destroyer was essentially a self-propelled anti-tank gun. These vehicles were all lightly armored with an open turret to reduce weight and improve mobility. They were also equipped with high-velocity guns needed to penetrate the armor of enemy tanks. Doctrine was developed for the employment of tank destroyers. They would initially be withheld as a reserve in the friendly rear area. Once the expected mass panzer attack occurred, they would then counter, also in mass, to defeat the enemy panzers. Influenced by what they saw in the Battle of France, American doctrine writers assumed that the panzers operated on their own and could be stripped away by the tank destroyers. This was a specialized solution to defeat a very specific scenario. The Americans made no attempt to incorporate or train the tank destroyers as part of a combined arms team. 
They were to be pooled in groups, retained at the Corps and Army levels, awaiting to be called forward when needed. The U.S. pools combat power. Tank destroyer doctrine nested well with another unique concept adopted by the United States Army in World War II, the pooling of specialized equipment. The U.S. economy was capable of mechanizing a vast majority of the U.S. Army, but General McNair argued that it was essential to streamline all U.S. infantry divisions. With an entire ocean to cross and only limited shipping available, the U.S. Army could not afford to send unnecessary equipment to Europe. McNair's opinion was that not every division would need every piece of equipment for every mission, particularly those that were defensive in nature. A limited amount of these defensive-oriented units could be pooled as battalions and controlled by brigade-size elements known as groups. War planners conceptualized that pooled units such as tank, tank destroyer, and anti-aircraft battalions would be temporarily assigned to divisions as requested. But this procedure, like the tank destroyer doctrine, was not conducive to building combined arms teams. With this untested doctrine in place, it appeared that the Americans were rushing towards the same fate as the French. Even the organizational charts of the 1940 French division and 1942 American division look similar. It was not until the Americans engaged the Germans in combat that they adjusted their organizations and modified their procedures in several critical ways to employ combined arms warfare. The U.S. divisions keep their pools. We started out with the idea of streamlining and pooling is we'll only give you the units if you need them. But it is so difficult to work with a strange unit that once you get that attachment, you want to keep it with you. U.S. division commanders in the European Theater of Operations realized that they did, in fact, need those specialized weapon systems permanently attached. The German forces they faced in 1944 were not the forces the French faced in 1940. Until the Battle of the Bulge at the end of 1944, the Germans did not mass their panzers in the Blitzkrieg style that the Americans expected and planned for. German mechanized forces were dispersed, conducting defensive operations. Since the Americans almost always retained the initiative, their infantry was in constant need of armor support as they advanced across France. Once attached to divisions, tank battalions and tank destroyer battalions remained on a semi-permanent basis. To increase subordinate units' firepower, tank companies were attached to regiments, who in turn provided platoons to infantry battalions. Unfortunately, there were simply not enough tank battalions to fulfill the demand. Enter the tank destroyer. It looked like a tank. It moved like a tank. It fired like a tank. Not surprisingly, tank destroyers were substituted for tanks. If the infantry officers commanding these attached tank destroyer platoons understood their limitations, they could be effective as infantry support. The problem with that whole approach was this was an add-on. It was a separate unit by itself, not part of the overall combined force. That's one problem. It trains by itself. It has its own doctrine by itself. And frankly, the rest of the Army doesn't understand it. And particularly when we develop the self-propelled versions of the tank destroyers, they look very much like tanks. So to the average infantryman, it says, hey, it's a tank. Why can't it help support me in the attack? But the fact is, the tank destroyer doesn't have the armor protection for that role. It's meant to be hold down on the defense, as I mentioned earlier, and sort of conducting an ambush against the enemy tanks. The tank destroyer made important contributions during World War II. It was very effective on several occasions in France, for example. Uh, it was such a specialized weapon that neither the equipment nor the doctrine of a, of a separate tank destroyer arm survived after the war. The Balanced Commands
Another important factor that allowed the Americans to avoid the French disaster of 1940 was their command structure. Unlike the French army, who tended to operate in pure infantry formations, American commanders had a better understanding of how to command the tanks, tank destroyers, and engineers attached to them. In the case of World War II, as a practical matter, it was fairly common that an infantry regiment would have attached to it anti-aircraft battalion, a tank battalion, or a company at least of a tank battalion, extra trucks so it could be more motorized, uh, tank destroyers if they were available. And that means that your bare bones regiment of three infantry uh, battalions and a limited amount of fire support uh, then ends up being something almost twice as large. They are habitually attached, they work together for most of the war. And what you have then is almost a small combined arms motorized force built around a regiment, and it's usually called a regimental combat team. Additionally, in 1943, the U.S. Armored Division was reorganized into a more balanced force. Regimental headquarters disappeared and were replaced with skeleton headquarters known as combat commands. These commands allowed for units to be task organized to fit the mission. U.S. Fire Support. The final factor that allowed the United States Army to become a premier combined arms force was their unequaled fire support. While German and American artillery batteries delivered similar firepower, the United States had an advantage. One of the U.S. Army's advantages, both during World War II and ever since, has been the fire direction center. Most armies of the world basically operated with one artillery battery or maybe a battalion, one forward observer connected to them often by uh, field telephones, and one target. The problem then becomes what happens when you have a target that needs more than one artillery battery fired on it. And between the world wars, the, the uh, field artillery school developed something that has become pretty common even for mortars since then in the U.S. Army, and that is a fire direction center, a means of calculation where if the observer can give you an estimate of the location of the target plus the angle from which he is viewing that target, then you can adjust from that. And you can have artillery batteries and battalions up to all the artillery in a, in a field army if you want to, firing on one location at one time. This was an enormous advantage that all the other armies uh, didn't have. The U.S. Army Air Forces also employed powerful ground support squadrons. These aircraft were heavily armed, and had the ability to communicate with ground troops, allowing for more direct and timely support. This combination of air and ground fire support was often key to U.S. ground forces overwhelming an enemy. While the U.S. Army was initially unprepared for modern combined arms warfare in 1942, innovative leadership, combat experience, and a flexible organizational structure created the conditions for this army to transform aided by an immense industrial complex that produced a highly mechanized army, the United States created what was arguably the premier combined arms force by 1945. Specialized doctrinal concepts like pooling did not survive the war. Current combined arms concepts, such as exercising mission command and integrating warfighting functions did survive and can trace their lineage back to the U.S. innovations of World War II.